Hey guys, Matt, Iron Trap Garage. Today we're gonna to be doing a discussion in our Hot Rodding 101 series on flathead intakes. This is something that we get asked about a lot when we're selling parts. What intake do I need? What one to look for? What's this intake worth? And on and on and on. We figured we kind of put a condensed version of basically everything you need to know to get started into the world of flathead multiple carburetor intakes. Obviously, we are big fans of old speed equipment and uh, flatheads especially, and we thought we would do a talk about this today. We're gonna add a little bit of discussion in by our friend Pete, who has a big collection of flathead intakes and has a lot of great input into this, and we're gonna flop back and forth between he and I and show some of our favorite intakes and why they're our favorites. All right, the first thing we're going to talk about is number of carburetors. So on your intake, you have everything from a single carburetor, which is stock, all the way up to four carburetors. That's what you're gonna find for a flathead. I don't know if I've ever seen anything that's more. If they are out there, it's probably too many carburetors for a flathead. So the number of carburetors that you need to run really is up to how much engine you have behind or underneath of those carburetors. So while it looks cool to have four carbs on your engine, more is better, it looks more extravagant. It is a little bit more of a tuning nightmare. And also it's gonna probably be over carbureted if you don't have an engine that is built up to take all of that carburation. From my experience, what you'll find most commonly is an intake that is set up for two two barrel carburetors, a two two intake. That intake will pretty much cover Almost everyone, especially that's driving on the street, can get away with two Stromberg or Holley carburetors, two, two barrels. Um, basically the jetting and how you set everything up is going to help out how you're going to run those carburetors, but everything from like a stock engine all the way up to a full race flathead can pretty much get away with a 2-2 intake if you set your carburetion up correctly. The other nice thing about a 2-2 intake is it is the most simple. Most of them are fairly low rise intakes. You don't really have to do anything crazy with your uh, throttle pedal linkage or carburetor linkage. Um, and a lot of these intakes, the 2-2s, you can put a generator in a stock location, which we'll get into a little later. The 3-2 intakes are definitely look a little bit better. Uh, the 3-2 intakes, you can also get away with running, depending on the intake, you can get away with running a progressive linkage, which is really nice because you can run a single center carburetor most of the time when you're idling and bopping around town, and you can set it up that the two outer carburetors are gonna give you more fuel when you mash the throttle and you're trying to race or just have some spirited driving. Now the 4-2 intake is the Mac Daddy. That's the one that looks the craziest. It is the one that you know everybody wishes they could have on there just because it looks cool and they come in different configurations. But 4-2 intakes is a lot. Unless you have an engine that's built up pretty good, have a good camshaft, you're going to have some trouble. Now one little trick that people do to get away with that is running a smaller CFM carburetor. So like a Stromberg 81 you can run and you're putting less air and thus less fuel into the engine. You can get away with four of those 81 carburetors. They were found stock on the V860s and also Stromberg offered them as an aftermarket item. The only downside is the 81s are more expensive than a Stromberg 97, so be prepared to pay if you're looking for four 81 carburetors that actually work and function, which means you're probably gonna have to buy eight 81 carburetors to make four good ones. Everybody had their own little twist, and I think that's why there are so many variations in these intakes. Every company, every engineer had an idea. Let's say, hey, let's try it. Many of them didn't work. It was common stuff. It laid all over the place. You could pick it up for nickels and dimes. I mean, when I started collecting intakes, the first time I did this, with the first collection, uh, I felt bad when I had to spend $40 for an intake because, gee, that's an expensive one. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the days of the 5 and 10 and $20 intakes went by the wayside. As the interest actually started coming back on the flatheads, that dictated the value, so to speak, and uh, it became unaffordable for a lot of guys. And I always said I was really lucky that I was smart enough to collect them the first time, then I got stupid and sold them, and then I got smart again and decided to buy them while I could still afford them, and then all of a sudden it went crazy. All right, next thing we're gonna to touch on is the types of intakes. So we've already kind of covered the number of carburetors you're going to find. I didn't really get into the different variations of that, and that's what we're gonna talk about here. So starting with 
Most commonly, again, your 2-2 intake is the one you're gonna see most often, and that comes in all shapes and sizes. Everything from a totally flat intake, low rise, very low, it's essentially like a plate almost. Those low rise intakes are kind of like really strictly for racing. A lot of times those intakes are four two intakes and they will have basically on each corner a carburetor that will feed each bank or two cylinders at a time. And those intakes are definitely set up for racing, wide open throttle, Bonneville racing, drag racing, things like that. And they're not really that great for the street, but you can get around that and you can make them work on the street. They may not be the best. Now low rise intakes generally for value, they're pretty high if you're looking for those super low rise intakes. And again, they come in all different variations. Now there's what I'm gonna call the kind of like low mid rise type intake. That is the most common. That's the one you're gonna see that has been copied over and over again. Edelbrock made them, Offenhauser made them, Fenton made them. Basically every company out there almost that made an intake made this kind of like low mid rise type intake that's like what I would call a street intake. Those are basically like the best intakes to run if you just want something you can throw on, have a little more carburetion, looks cool, and is going to function well. One thing you're gonna be looked for if you want something that's very simple is a 2-2 intake. There's that street style, low mid rise that is going to have provision for your generator in the front, which again, we will get to a little bit later. Next thing you're gonna talk about is the, there's a mid rise intake. These are intakes to have just a little bit of rise to them. They're gonna, you know, the idea with those is at higher RPMs, you're getting kind of like a ram effect with those. So the mid rise ones, they're a little less common, but you do see them, I think fixed in, had like a mid-rise type one, there might've been a tatters field. There's a few other companies out there that had those intakes. They're a little more, I guess you could say on the, on the rare side, um, they didn't seem to be that popular. It seems like everybody went either with the street style, like low mid-rise one, to a high-rise intake, which is one of my favorites, of course. So when you're looking for those intakes, I don't know if there's really any um, anything better about those necessarily, especially on the street. It's just more rarity, if you will. If you find one that's obscure, it's kind of neat to find one of them. You put it on the guy next to you at a car show won't have it. The last one is a high rise intake. This is the one that pretty much, like in the early days of the dry lakes and the old magazines and books, everybody had, a, not everybody, but most people had high rises on in a lot of those old cars you see, roadsters and stuff on the dry lakes. A lot of the really famous cars had them on there in the early speed equipments that companies that became legendary and are still in business these days were making those high rise intakes. So you have um, pretty much all the big hitters back in the day, Edelbrock had one, um, Thixton had one, Wyan had a high rise. I think Wyan was one of the earliest mass produced ones. Um, and Eddie Myers, there was all these different variations that went on. Some of the really early high rises, like we have on the 32 DeLorean Roadster that I built, I procured a Jack Henry intake, which is essentially a high rise that was built out of a 33 Ford intake. So factory aluminum single carbur carburetor intake that he then had the top high rise section cast and would weld it to that stock intake and create his own high rise. That was one of the earliest ones. That's again, what I said about one of the earliest mass produced. Wine was probably one of the earliest ones. One of the most common you saw. Fixed in is probably, I would say the most famous. That or the Edelbrock Slingshot. But there was all these different variations of high rises. There's lots of obscure brands that made them that we could go on and on about. Um, some of them just had uh, the high rise that went straight up. Some of them had came together with a little like, for lack of a better term, blast box. Some of them were water heated where it had a high rise and there was ports in the side of it that would help um, keep your charge at the same temperature as the engine as it was heating up. So you didn't get carburetors that frosted, which is a problem with the high rises. But there was all different variations. They all had their gimmicks. Really, they're just one of the most iconic early speed equipment parts to put on a hot rod. That's why they're so sought after. I think one of the only companies that are making them still was the Edelbrock Slingshot. I think they may have stopped producing that or they've been out of stock for a very long time. I know the Fixtons are still, I believe, being reproduced. Um, Baron might make them. There's a couple companies that are making them still to this day. 
Um, but there are so many out there on the market in the used market that you can find them quite easily. High rises are my favorite because there were so many early high rises of different variations. They are really fun to collect and really sets your engine apart and your car apart having those carburetors sitting up nice and high. All right, so up top here, I have a bunch of different high rises. We have, of course, the really famous uh, Edelbrock slingshot intake. This intake I found the top portion, the slingshot portion separately somewhere. And then I later found the bottom half somewhere and put them together. A lot of times you would see they get separated like that. But the slingshot is probably one of the most famous and sought after high rises. This is a good example out of a, a two piece intake with like a blast box. So Harrell, uh, I think ENS or ENJ, there was a couple different companies that made them. Um, and basically you could remove this top portion like the Harrells, I think they made a 3-2 or a 4-2 that you took that top base off and then it would have a new blast box that would have three or four carburetors. The 2-2 is probably one of the more common. It's a very rare intake, but you usually see the 2-2s. Um, that one's really cool. Eddie Myers, well, I wouldn't say it's a blast box, but this has the box style, but this one is actually set up for the water heated intake. So this is an early Eddie Myers intake, pretty cool. It has the ports on the side. It would have been for uh, heating the intake charge when it's going in. And this is a good example of an original fixed in and original paint. So the fixed in intakes, and I believe the heads even, um, and definitely the intakes were painted red from the factory. Most of the times people polish them and uh, put them in their engine bay and polish them and things like that, or they just lost the paint over the years or were repainted or blasted. This is really cool because this is original paint as it would have come. And other than some scratches and everything, that's exactly how it was. And it also has the optional fixed in finned air cleaner that goes on top. Fixed in had an air cleaner that matched a lot of these high rises. That's a finned air cleaner you can put on the top of that. Looks really, really cool, but needs to be in the right car because it adds additional height to your high rise. And in all, in all reality, in, in the world of flathead intake collectors, I consider myself a grade schooler. And I have pictures and I have seen collections that you would say they were college seniors. Mm -hmm. These guys had it together. I'm talking hundreds and hundreds of different intakes. Hard to believe that there were so many manufactured and still there were sales for them, that there were so many guys into them. All right, so next thing we're gonna talk about, and this is probably one of the most commonly asked things on all the different flathead groups on the internet. We get emails about it all the time, comments in our videos, and that is rarity versus cost on flathead intakes. So much like I like to do in these high riding 101 videos, I'm not gonna get into every variation, the most rare intake, different things like that. We'll just talk about the values, some of the rare intakes, and I'll show you a couple of my favorites that I have. So um, as far as rarity goes, the number of carburetors definitely can distinguish the value of the intake. Doesn't mean it's more rare, but generally for uh, rule of thumb, a common two carburetor intake versus a common four carburetor intake, you're gonna pay more for a four carb intake. Um, but the rarity is really just a matter of how few of them were produced. A lot of these early speed equipment, especially some of the high rises, there was not many of them made. They didn't work very well, to be, to be frank. And uh, because of that, there's not many of them around anymore. So uh, a lot of the high rises are very highly sought after. They can be very expensive. I mentioned earlier, like my Jack Henry, um, I have one of the blast boxes up above me, um, e, e and S and a couple different, there's a bunch of different ones that are um, variations of the same intake, but they're all a lot of like high rises that can be quite valuable. One of the other ones that are super rare is the super low rise intakes. A lot of those are four carburetor intakes where the carbs a lot of times are staggered, but the four carburetor intakes are very rare. They're really mostly for racing, but guys do get away with running them on the street. But the four carburetor staggered intakes look really wild on a flathead. Really hard to find. A lot of them were produced in super low numbers because they were mainly for racing. Even some of them were prototypes, things like that. And they're really hard to find. They also are kind of difficult to make linkage for. So keep that in mind. If this is the first time you're building up a flathead engine or hopping one up and you put one of these staggered 4-2 intakes on your engine, you're gonna have a steep learning curve with trying to get that thing running and functioning on your car. Now the most common intakes and definitely the cost uh, 
is associated with that is a lot of those like what I was calling street intakes, low mid rise, flathead intakes like the Offenhauser, Edelbrock, a lot of these YN 22s a lot of those intakes are really inexpensive. You'll end up finding those intakes in the, I mean, a swap meet anywhere from like 200 to 350 dollars in that range. A lot of those intakes can be found. Sometimes you can find them even cheaper, 125, 150 dollars. We got to hunt a little bit, but a lot of those intakes when we get them, we sell them in that range, 250 to 350 is kind of like the common range. That's like a good entry level intake that you can put on your vehicle. Again, if you search and hunt and dig around, maybe you could find a 50 dollar one, but that's hard to find in this day and age. Now obviously these really rare high rise ones and the staggered 4-2 intakes and some of the rare 3-2 intakes that are, you know, as they go up, you're gonna go up in levels. So after you get past your 350 price range, you're gonna be right in smack at four to six hundred dollars. And that's a lot of these 3-2 intakes, some of the little more obscure 2-2 intakes where you're getting into some of the one-off brands. And then when you get into the rare low 4-2s and obscure high-rise intakes, it's pretty much starts at a thousand bucks and just goes to the limit. How much you wanna pay and who's gonna be bidding against you or going after it is really the answer on that. But if you hunt around and you're just looking for something that's just, you know, you wanna put on your car and running and driving, it's good to look for the Edelbrocks, the Fentons, um, Wyans, all those intakes, uh, Offenhauser, of course, were all mass produced and you can get those used. If you want brand new, obviously, Edelbrocks are still being produced. Offenhauser is still being produced and is a great company to work with. They have all their same patterns that they used back in the day. They're still making intakes with, so I think that's a good company to um, go with if you are looking for a brand new intake. And then we've, again, we've mentioned there's some reproductions and multiple generations that are uh, families that are still making these parts. I you know, like the fixed in and the barren and those different ones that you could still buy today. Great intakes. So if you don't want to hunt around for old stuff, you can go right to the source and buy those. But do realize that you're probably going to spend on a brand new intake today where you could buy an old, much little more rare intake used. So it's just a matter if you want to deal with strip threads and chipped up and different things like that to have the rarity versus a shiny new intake that you can just bolt on and go. That decision is really up to you. Well, Almquist came up with a lot of variations. Uh, he was one of the first serious manufacturers of speed equipment way back. And uh, I was fortunate enough to spend time with, with Almquist. And the word character, you know, I'm meek, mild, and quiet compared to Almquist. And he would come up with ideas and again, he'd have this Ray Stillwell tested to see if it actually worked. And as soon as he was happy with his design, he went into manufacturing. And uh, they made this stuff. And he had so many variations. Uh, my first collection of this stuff, I had, I don't know, six, maybe seven different Almquist intakes. And after I realized I made a mistake by selling everything and started over again, uh, it was getting a little harder to find the stuff because guys were starting to collect it as I did. His intakes and his heads and stuff were just top shelf. Top shelf. Have you ever seen anything but two twos or were they only two twos? You know, again, I never ran across anything other than the two twos intakes. And my thinking again is that he was catering to the young gen younger generation, the low dollar kids that could afford an intake and you know, go from there. Uh, Pete Peterman, my very close friend from down near Philly, very first piece of speed equipment he bought was an Almquist 2-2's intake, because he could afford it. And when he told Ed Almquist that, Ed cracked up. He said, That's, that was my market. So these two intakes here are a good example of regional intakes. Um, Almquist was a big uh, East Coast company uh, that we can you know, see a lot of Almquest intakes out there. But when you go to the other coast, there's uh, for regional, this is some pretty obscure ones. So this is like a Pacific Northwest. Um, I think Columbia was the company that, or Shanafelt was the company that originally made these, but they were made with all different names. So I have uh, 
two versions here, a Columbia and a Lance that are pretty obscure. They're all, like I said, I think they were all made in the Pacific Northwest and you see all different ones. I've seen one that says Katie on it, which is pretty obscure, but there's all these different intakes. They all have the same kind of like low rise design with the slant nose in the front and the fins on them with just a different configuration of the name. It's pretty cool because pretty much regionally there was speed equipment companies that made their own intakes and speed equipment. So if you're from that area, it's really fun to search for them. Obviously like Granatelli, Grandcore, you can see that if you're from the Midwest area, that was really popular. California got like every speed equipment company ever. So you guys, forget about you guys. You have you're spoiled. But if you're from like the East Coast or from the Midwest, there's a lot of different companies that, uh, small companies that made speed equipment. This is a good example. It's fun to hunt these because I'm from the East Coast. I've only, uh, only ever found these in intakes when I've gone to the Pacific Northwest for whatever reason. I don't think they were very popular. They weren't mass produced or mass sold. So that was more of a regional thing. So it's fun when you travel to swap meets and shows and different things like that you can find intakes or speed equipment that's not from your area. Really cool to collect and it's nice to impress your buddies when you bring them back home that don't have that stuff or can't ever find it. All right, what flathead intake do you need for your car? It's really a matter of preference of what works best for you and what you want it to look like. Again, I've referenced earlier in this video, a lot of this is uh, people like myself that you want something that's different than the next guy. So you start looking for weird, obscure intakes and things like that. And you're going to get into some stuff where you may get obscure intakes that just do not work. There was some speed equipment produced over the years that definitely in the early days they were trying anything. And some of those intakes just plain didn't work or, or worked poorly. And that's why there's not many of them around. Stupid people like myself like to try and put them on vehicles and try and make them work and pull their hair out. But I, if you're just getting into this, I definitely would not start going right for the most rare or obscure or weird looking intake because they're probably a pain in the butt to make work. But what works for you? I really suggest if you're doing, you know, a pretty mild car, you're just getting into this, just do one of those street low mid-rise 2-2 intakes. They're really easy to set up. They're, um, they're pretty inexpensive and you can get one on a car and running without too much hassle. Again, you can buy a lot of them still brand new. So that's why a lot of times I suggest for people when they ask us, what should I go with? Get one of those intakes because they're really simple. And the nice thing is you can always upgrade it. Once you get the car running really good and you drive it for a while, you wanna put a high rise on it, then all you're doing is just changing some linkage and things like that. Everything else will work just fine. But if you want something that looks a little more extravagant, then definitely you may wanna go with a high rise, a 3.2, a 4.2, all of those look crazy, but make sure that you have the ability to tune them and you have the engine that can also match what you're doing. I think 99% of the flatheads that are out there running around on the streets are over carbureted and people have engines that are basically stock or are stock with 2.2, two twos on them and they're over jetted and over carbureted and they run super rich and uh, they just run around like that. There's also guys running around with nearly stock engines with three and four twos and they're wondering why they're having terrible fuel consumption and also blowing black smoke out the back of their tailpipe. Well, probably because you have too many carburetors, but hey, it does look really cool and I can't argue with that. All right, so this intake here is another good example of intakes that were used the same molds and they're very similar, they are the same, in, same intake. So this intake is an Allard intake. So yes, for the car, an Allard. This intake actually takes, has some British Solex carburetors on it. I think they're British. Uh, Solex carburetors on it, on, these Allard, on this Allard intake and would have ran on an Allard vehicle that came with a flathead Ford engine. This intake is actually an Eddie Myers intake that they basically took an Eddie Myers intake back to England and they cut, replicated it and cast it with the Allard name in it. So these intakes are basically the same as like the low rise Eddie Myers 2.2 intake that you might see uh, with some small little differences. So this is really neat when you see these because this is obscure, really was only made for to be put on the Allard vehicles. Obviously there was some extras that are floating around there that they cast more than vehicles that were out there. So you sometimes can find like new never mounted ones. But this is another good example of just the variations that you can find of the same casting, different name, different carburetors, maybe different fuel pump setup, things like that. Um, but this one's pretty cool. I, while it's not something that is gonna help perform better, it is pretty obscure. And if you wanna put it on your vehicle, it's gonna definitely make people scratch your heads if you put it in a Model A and it's not an Allard. 
the Fenton intake is one of the very first ones I ever found, and uh, for a good reason. There was a lot of them around. But then I got I started picking up these other oddball names, and I'm thinking, my goodness, you know, they look like a Fenton intake. Well, I did some research, and again, this is just what I was told, and again, it seems believable, especially when you stare at them. Uh, the Fenton salesman would come into your new startup little speed shop, and he'd say, listen, if you take on, let's say, $2,000 worth of our product, we'll produce yeah, six, eight, ten intakes with your name on that you can use, and it was called the incentive program. They would, like, sort of bribe you into buying or taking on their product, and they would give you something in return. So one of the very first ones I found after that was the DNS. And I remember the next one that I found in this incentive line is this AA Custom. Is there a lot of uh, intakes that uh, more than what you have for the incentive or that? I, I would imagine there are. And I don't actively pursue the stuff like I used to. It, it's now if I find an intake, it's by accident. Okay. You know, I don't go out, I don't walk the flea markets anymore. And, and I'm sure, I'm sure, I, you know, I put money on it. There's others out there. There's got to be. You know, I don't think only three companies took advantage of it. Mm -hmm. One thing to consider when you're looking to buy flathead intakes is the generator location. Um, some of the intakes that are out there that are really, really good uh, are set up and simple to use are set up for using a stock generator. So some of these two twos that are out there are actually have the carburetor set back a little bit that you can put a stock generator right in the original location. It makes things really, really simple. Even some of the high rise intakes like the fixed in, they set everything back that allows for you to run a stock generator, which is really nice. Um, those intakes are really good. So if you see that it has that front mount that looks like stock on it with the center, big center bolt hole, um, and then the carburetors are set back quite a ways. That's how you can tell. A lot of the Edmonds intakes, uh, two twos were like that, where they had them set back. Really good street intake, and you can, again, just bolt it right on. You don't have to make many modifications to your engine bay, other than just some small changes to your throttle linkage. Now, the other styles that are out there is, are maybe a three or four two intake that still has that boss on the front of it that looks like you would run a generator on there. You cannot fit a generator on there. Pretty much, I don't know if there's any 3-2 intakes. I'm sure there isn't. 3-2 intakes that you could fit um, a stock generator on there. Um, so those intakes, you have to run an offset generator mount. So depending on the style of engine or style of mount you're running, they sold a style that uses kind of like a, a like C-shaped, if you, for lack of a better term, um, bracket that will use an APA generator with a strap. There's some that have brackets that on the earlier heads that bolt onto the head itself and puts the generator off to the side. Um, all of those kind of, it's your decision on what you want to use, but the nice thing is with those style that have the boss on the front, you can bolt one of those brackets on, run it off the side, or you can run a cut down generator to use as like an idler for your belts to keep your same belt configuration uh, on it and also tension your uh, belts with it. The last one is kind of like a, a stump, stumpy intake in the front or a slant nose intake, whatever you want to call it. Um, on those intakes, they basically have no provision for any type of generator mount. There's two two intakes that are like that. There are, you know, all the racing intakes, they don't have a provision for that. And that's where you'll need to run that bracket off the side of the head. Um, so they actually go on the studs of the head, either driver's side, passenger side, you run a generator, offset off that, that will have that boss on it that the generator can slide on. And then you can tension your belt that way, or you can also run one of those, uh, some type of idle or setup. But with those, generally, you can just tension like you would standard off to the side, pull your generator up, tighten the bolt down, and it works just fine. Most of the intakes, I don't want to say most of them, but a lot of the intakes that you will see out there for sale are not set up for using a stock generator, and you will need to do some sort of offset setup. So keep that in mind when you're shopping for your intake. If you don't like that look, then you're going to have a much smaller number of intakes that you can purchase based on your generator location. Uh, Eddie Edmonds, he was, he produced some really neat parts. My personal favorite for the street 
is either one of these with the setback that you can run a generator on top. It's what I run on the convertible. You know, I've run them on several cars and they were great. But I've had people ask me, how comes there's so many different logos on the intakes? And I said, well, this is the, the explanation that I was given years ago and I can believe it. Edmonds was really good at designing and promoting his product. What, what the main thing is have him the stuff manufactured. So what he was doing, and this is in the pre uh, computer age, and even telephones were like, you know, not everybody had one. He'd go to these foundries with his designs, and he would have them do the molds and cast these intakes. And his favorite deal was make me uh, 50 and I'll see if they sell and he'd get them made and pay for them then he'd come back and say yep they sell make me uh, 500 he'd come and he'd pick them up and he'd say I'll get the check to you as soon as I get back to my office or whatever and he would disappear and uh, every intake has a different logo and that's why they were done at different foundries with different pattern makers and they would put the name in and uh, you know Edmonds custom I have some so I had I don't know if I still have it one that said Eddie Edmonds that on was, the intake is that an early that's the very first I would say the very first runs that he did it said Eddie Edmonds and then it went to the Edmonds custom different logos for Edmonds custom just plain Edmonds uh, slight variations on all the intakes and that was basically because he was bouncing from foundry to foundry all over the country and uh, did quite well they didn't but he did now is there any have you ever seen like a 3-2 or 4-2 Edmonds yeah I have never seen a 3 or 4 car car Edmonds intake could exist I don't know all right the holy grail stuff for types of flathead intakes is where we start type getting into forced induction and injection. So for flatheads, uh, Hillborn kind of, uh, one of the first things Hillborn made was flathead injection. Um, and those intakes are floating around out there. Hillborn injection was made for a number of years. It changed uh, styles. So the early Hillborns uh, will actually say a Hillborn Tavers on the, on the uh, intake because he had a partner in the early days. Those intakes are gonna have no stacks on them. They look kind of odd, like something's missing, but that's exactly how they were. Super rare. Any of the flathead Hillborn intakes are very rare, hard to find whether they have the stacks or not. Obviously, they are pretty much like race only. I know some people have gotten them to work on the street, but for the most part, they're mainly race only. Really cool thing with the injection is all of them are numbered and you can actually email Hillborn and they have pretty much all the receipts and records about every Hillborn they've made. And so if you're nerdy, you can find out who bought yours originally, what engine it was for, and so on and so forth. So forced induction, that is something that we're all hunting for. If you're into collecting vintage speed equipment, a blower for a flathead is really, really cool. There is a handful of companies that made blower intakes. There are a lot of homemade blower intakes because there were so few of them out there you don't see them uh, very commonly. So probably the one of the most sought after, uh, two, let's say two sought after blower intakes and blower configurations for flatheads is a Scott or Itel um, intake and blowers, uh, which is basically Itel started out as an Italian company that was then Scott, uh, became Scott later on. Um, those intakes were made specifically for flatheads for those different size of blowers. And you saw them in a lot of the early dry lakes and also Bonneville and drag racing um, a lot of the cars ran those. They are highly sought after these days to find original intakes. But you also see more commonly a lot of 471 intakes that were homemade to put a 471 blower on a flathead or even 671, which is getting pretty crazy. But you do see that quite often on flatheads, but a lot of those intakes are homemade if they are truly vintage. The other thing that you start seeing out there as you get pretty obscure is like McCullough blowers. McCullough blower kits were basically, as far as I realize, uh, as far as I know, is like the first like kit, uh, blower kit that was mass produced 
so to speak, for a flathead. So McCullough blowers, the real early ones, I think 37 might have been the first year. Um, they had a, I think they utilized like a stock intake. And then after that, they started having their own intake with the blower on top. Really cool. They have the coolant built in them. They look all crazy. They don't really put out a lot of boost. It's kind of like farting in the wind. I mean, they make some, they make some, some changes. <laughs> Mike's laughing. <laughs> we call it blower, like farting in the wind. Um, we so, need a t-shirt. Yes, we need a t-shirt. So, McCullough blowers, while they are cool, we had one on the Roadster pickup. They are neat for the wow factor because they are obscure, they look so different. They didn't make a lot of boost. They had some things that could be upgraded in them, um, which you definitely can do, but don't expect to make any crazy power with a McCullough blower. But if you get into running like a Scott or an ITAL blower or a, four, or a 471, you're gonna start making some real power to see some upgrades. Um, some noticeable upgrades when you put those on, but you definitely have a little jump in power with the McCulloughs. It's just don't expect something crazy. And for dollar for dollar, you're definitely going to get more power out of a Scott, ITAL, or 471 blower set up on a flathead than a McCullough or even the super rare Frenzel, which they only made a few of and are now being reproduced. Those blowers didn't make quite as much power as you will see out of um, a 471 or a Scott or an ITEL. So keep that in mind, but those blower intakes are pretty hard to find. Again, it doesn't really matter in the end of the day, you're putting this big old blower on top of it. You can't really see the intake, but if you're into collecting them, uh, a few of the early ones that you can find, like I said, were Scott and ITEL type blowers uh, intakes that you saw out on the market. So we're talking about flathead intakes. We can't go without talking about the uh, splitters. So the single carburetor to two carburetor splitters. There was a million, not a million, a bunch of companies that made them. I think the Dixie Western was, was probably the earliest one that you would see. Um, and, but probably the most common by far is the Almquest. Almquest made different versions. They even have, if you notice, there's a misspelling. This one up here. There's all different versions of them. Basically, they took a single carburetor and went to two carburetors. So like this one I have is kind of an oddball. It's from like a two, barrel carburetor, the two singles. And then over here, you can see I have like a blast box style and they were all meant to go on a stock intake like that. All different variations. Doesn't mean any one of them works any better. You're still trying to put all that air and fuel down into the same opening. So it really doesn't do a lot. Refer back to my farting in the wind thing. Uh, it's kind of the same idea. So, but it is really fun to collect. It's something to mention if you want something on a budget. A lot of these splitters can be bought in the 100 to $200 range for the common ones. So much cheaper than you can buy a uh, two carburetor intake, a cheap one. So if you wanna just put something on that looks cool, that's a good option. Or if you're doing one of those McCullough blowers or something like that, you can put that on there and it looks even crazier. It's really, really neat. All right, how to tell real from fake or repro from fake intakes. Uh, in the end of the day, it really doesn't matter if the intakes fake or real. It's just a matter of not overpaying for something that isn't a real vintage intake. So a lot of the popular intakes have been repopped over the years. Some of them in small quantities, some of them are still being made. So like the Offenhauser intakes, for instance, there is no such thing as a repro because the company has been in business from basically day one all the way through till today, they are still making intakes. They're made on the same molds. So there, there's no such thing as a fake Offenhauser intake. Now there is some variations over the years that they did where they changed the molds a little bit. So if you're really nerdy about collecting flathead intakes, you can get different variations of the Offenhauser intakes for, for instance. Uh, also there's Edelbrock is another, obviously one of the huge companies that's still making intakes for flatheads. Uh, while those intakes are not exactly like the old ones, uh, they are very similar. But a lot of the Edelbrock intakes, for instance, that I've noticed, like they remade the Slingshot intake. Slingshot is one of the most iconic high rises and sought after high rise intakes. That intake is pretty easy to um, notice or identify a repro from a real one because the bases on all of the Slingshots that I've really come across to repro or the new ones, I shouldn't say reproduction because Edelbrock's making them, but they put like a big made in USA badge right on the base on the, you know, the main intake portion, which is really easy to identify. It is a good thing that's made USA, but it also helps us identify a true vintage one versus a real one. 
But another thing you can look for when you're looking at these intakes is a lot of times the castings of repro intakes are a little better than old intakes because the quality of materials they were using and the molds and things like that they were doing back in the day, a lot of them were not as nice in the finish on the castings as far as porosity, uh, the machining, different things like that may not be quite as good as what you would see on a reproduction. Fixed in intake is probably one of the ones that's the trickiest to identify. Um, a lot of the early high rises and some of the smaller companies actually stamped numbers on the intake with like the number, how many intakes they were making. And sometimes you can identify those, but over the years with intakes being polished and different things like that, really hard to tell. The fixed is probably one of the hardest ones to identify because they've been reproduced pretty well. They've been continuously reproduced for such a, reproduced for such a long time that an intake that was maybe made in the 70s or 80s, that was quite old and it might have that age to the aluminum or be beat up enough that it might look like a vintage one. Again, unless you're really into collecting and you're nerdy about this stuff, it doesn't matter. It's just don't pay, you know, over a thousand dollars for an intake, a fixed in intake that was produced last week. Try and find an original one if you can. Um, the other thing is there is a lot of intakes out there that were done in small quantities or small runs, uh, companies in Australia, New Zealand, things like that. And sometimes it may look like it might be a fake intake or you know, some type of fantasy company. There was a lot of obscure companies out there and more than likely it's the real deal. It might just be that it's you know, made so few of them that it is something that um, you don't see commonly. Or for instance, in the States, you don't see modern Australian or, news, or um, Kiwi intakes that are made um, and make their way over to the States. So they may look new, nice machines, nice castings. They're not necessarily a reproduction or anything like that. They're just something that we don't see very often. Um, but yeah, just make sure that you're checking out the intakes. If they have some kind of like old stamps in them, obviously if they're beat up and ground on and just look old and dirty, it's probably uh, a, uh, a real deal. But the, a lot of the really obscure intakes have not been reproduced. It's most of the ones that were really hard to find and they made small runs on them. You have to do some research on your own just to make sure that you are buying the real deal if somebody's asking a lot of money for it. But at the end of the day, if you want it and you like the price, just buy the darn thing, put it on your car, and who cares? It'll look cool going down the road. All right, so that's our Hot Rodding 101 flathead intakes. Tried to touch on everything I could think of very quickly. Again, there is we could talk for hours and hours about flathead intakes, but that's kind of a crash course. Hopefully it'll give you a little bit of information, some of the intakes that I have, some of the intakes that Pete's has, a little bit of background on some of the companies, and uh, it's just really neat to research this stuff and find the history. I hope we educated you a little bit if you're hunting for an intake, you know what's out there, what to look for, what to expect to pay. If you guys have a flathead collection or, or neat intake, I'd love to hear something down below. Drop what your favorite intake is on a flathead. We'd love to hear that and continue the discussion down in the comments like we do with all the Hot Rodding 101 videos. Thank you guys, appreciate it. Catch you later.